everybody. Welcome to the second episode of Donuts and Demand. Uh, we are so excited for everyone to be here. I see the chat is actually already blowing up in like the first minute. So that's super exciting. Uh, if you don't know, my name is Lindsay McGuire. I'm the Associate Director of Content and Campaigns here at Goldcast. And so I want to welcome you, like I said, to the second episode of Donuts and Demand. Um, and of course, there are donuts on the show. I don't know whether anyone in the audience has grabbed them, but we all three have. So mine is actually a uh, puppy chow donut, which I have never heard of a uh, puppy chow donut before, but I'm super pumped for it. Um, this is from Ohana Donuts and Ice Cream, if there are any indie locals here. Um, I've never had them before, so I'm super excited. Um, if you have strong donut opinions, feel free to drop them in the chat. And also talking about donuts and talking about the chat, we do have a giveaway today. So how you win or, or how you get an entry and then how you win is to engage in the chat, answer one of our polls. We'll have multiple polls happening throughout the episode and then also drop in a Q&A for us later at the end of the episode. Uh, and so we will be drawing five lucky winners out of our baker's hat for $20 gift cards so you can get coffee and donuts for the next episode in November. Um, so definitely drop by in the chat. Tell us where you're calling in from, what you're most excited to learn about today from Brian and Michelle. Um, we're excited to get started. A few things I want to cover before we dive in. If you want to learn about the organizations who are on this call today, which is LiveRamp and Zoom Info, please hop over to that bakery tab. Um, there's a video and some short information about each of them. If you want to connect with our speakers, that speakers tabs where you do that as well. And then, of course, the chat is popping off. Oh, I actually see our speaker for next month is in the chat. So, Susanna, huge shout out to you. Um, so, and then... Also, one last thing before we get kicked off is we are actually hosting an AI summit next week on Wednesday. It's running from 12 to 5 Eastern time or 9 to 12 uh, Pacific time. Or, yes, 9 to 12. Sorry, I had to check my time zones. And if you want to sign up for that, it is simply a one click on that button up the top right. Sign up for AI summit. Um, super easy. Click it and then we'll register you for that event next week. 12 fantastic speakers talking about how to use AI in marketing. Anyways, enough of me blabbing off here. It's time to get started. So like I said, welcome everyone to our second episode of Donuts and Demand, Goldcast show for demand generation marketers. I'm super excited to intro our first guest. Um, so Michelle Blondin is the director of demand generation at Zoom Info. So Michelle, welcome. I wanna know what donut you have and where you got it from. Hey, Lindsay, thank you for having me. Um, hi, everyone. And I do have a donut. I door dash donuts this morning uh, to prepare for this. So not a typical breakfast item for me, but I do love a good donut. My actual favorite is from Portland, Oregon, Blue Star, and they're like a brioche. But I went with what I have here in Reno, which is a local favorite Doughboy Donuts. And it's just a classic kind of a cake glaze. So very delicious. In my opinion, I love them. I've been struggling to not take a bite of it. <laughs> well, well, it sounds delicious. And don't worry, you will get to enjoy it. But, Brian, <laughs> but that's up to you, really. Like, I mean, you know, to each their own. So Brian, welcome. We're so excited to have you here. Brian is Vice President of Growth at Live Ramp. Brian, where is your sweet treat from? And what are you going to munch on? Okay, so I have absolutely no self-control or discipline, so I started working on my donut a little bit ago, and I got an apple fritter, a big apple fritter from uh, uh, Top Pot Donuts here uh, locally, and there's there's a local place in Redmond where I live. I love it. I love um, the little sprinkling of uh, fall flavor there, right? Uh, because That's right. Over. Um, and I did try to get a little spooky. I mean, you can't really see my pumpkin, but I do have a spooky gnome back here. So um, anyway, so we are going to get it kicked off. And the first question is kind of like generic, but also difficult. So Michelle, to get us kicked off, how do you define demand generation? Yeah, this should be easy, right? And being the very literal person I am, it's generating demand, but I think of it, right? It's part of my title. It's what I've been doing for so many years. I don't even want to count them. I think of it as a lot more complex than that, right? As demand gen marketers, we have, yes, to go create demand with cold audiences 
and seed those places where those buyers exist before they even realize we they want or need a solution that we're offering, right? So we're creating demand. We also need to go and capture that demand. So we're demand capturers. <laughs> and hopefully one of the maybe more important parts of this is once we capture, we get that form fill, we get that person coming to our site, we get them coming to an event like this, we need to convert. So it's a pretty, it's, a, it's so much more complex than just generating in my opinion, right? It's a, and it also takes a whole lot more than just the marketer. You're involving your, your brand team, your SDR team, your dev team, your sales team, obviously, maybe partner teams. So it's a, it's a whole revenue team, right? And so calling it demand gen is maybe selling it short, but um, that's kind of how I think of it these days. I like that. It's a very kind of... Um linear addition, right? Of having the right ingredients together to then be able to capture at the end of the day. So Brian, same question next to you. How do you define demand generation? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question for sure. So um, when you think about it, especially with complex B2B solutions, um, very few companies or customers are in market for your solution at any given time and <clears throat> trying to find that, you know, two or 3% that might be in market and then they'll respond and maybe raise their hands and want to have a conversation. That's really tricky. That that's, that's a tough part, but <clears throat> I agree with what Michelle said, where there to help create man, demand, you have to provide very helpful and useful content and information. Um, to the market for uh, people that may be poised, um, that may have a problem they've been thinking about, maybe thinking about changing the status quo, um, but they really don't know or they haven't been thinking about getting active yet in researching what, what the options are and what it would take. And if you can start reaching those, that audience and engaging them and start kind of seeding the market a little bit around some demand and then capturing that when they are willing to um, uh, raise their hand and have that conversation. That's that's where I view demand generation, I guess, because um, there is that demand generation. You're educating the audience, making useful content available, educating, um, but then you have to capture it and also create a level of trust with your audience where they want to be captured. Um, people are sick and tired of forms. Um, chat is working, but there's other ways that you have to make them feel comfortable with wanting to have a conversation with you. And I think it's a, the job of demand generation leaders or in teams to kind of create that trust so that people want to have that conversation and don't feel like they're just going to get hounded in a useful, a useless conversation. That is like a super fascinating way to set that up. Make it so that they are in a place where they want to be captured. I think that is such a fascinating way to think about that. And also, I don't know if anyone caught it, but he threw in kind of a spooky da -da -da stat there of like the two to three percent who are ready to buy, ready in market. I think that really hones in on the importance of demand generation and why this as a sub-segment of your go-to-market is so important because in reality, there's only a very finite group who is actually ready upon like discover your brand, discover your product that's ready to buy and in market. So that was a really excellent way to tie in the fact of like why it's important and then like how to execute it efficiently. Um, so thank you. Oh, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, so I, just to throw something in here, and I'm sure Michelle probably has some really cool thoughts about this too. Um, you know, especially in B2B, people are not, um, they're doing research. They're doing more and more and more research with content that's available on all kinds of different sources out there. And the, uh, the amount of research that's being done on a purchase decision before they actually talk to a sales rep is ridiculously long. And so, you know, I think depending on what analyst firm you're talking to, it could be 70 to 80% of a purchase decision is going to be completed um, before they actually want to talk to a sales rep. And then when they do talk to a sales rep, they don't want to talk to them too much. Uh, they just want to get the information they need and then move on. So I think building that trust and, you know, providing as much useful information as possible to kind of help you know, break through that barrier a little bit. Um, that's one of the biggest challenges, I think, 
we face on the demand generation side is just before you can even get to that conversation point. Yeah, hundred percent. I'd agree with that. And, and it's, yeah, I agree. Like we've, we've all read those reports, right? Like buyers have changed. They're going through a totally different process. The cycle is not what we think it is, you know, and it's so true. If I think about how I buy, um, you know, B2B tech, or even just as a consumer out there in the world, my buying has changed over the last many years. And I'm looking and doing my own research, becoming a little bit of like what I think of as an expert on that, on that buying decision myself, asking peers what they're thinking, right? I'm not necessarily waiting to be sold to or served up the exact right thing at the exact right time. But hopefully I do find it in those places I'm going to do the research, right? So that's where we have the opportunity to serve up that trusted content, be a trusted partner in that buying process, you know? And I think that's a huge word or key word, Brian, that you brought up and um, something we we can strive for as vendors. <laughs> yep. Trust. All about trust. And I think you're also alluding a little bit to dark social, which is also another fun sure. topic. Yeah. But before we move on, we're actually ready to go into our next segment, which is called Sprinkles of Demand. So what is Sprinkles of Demand about? Well, we're going to take a few moments for each of our guests to dive into two or three quick hit demand generation tips. So these are very bite-sized pieces of demand gen success tips you have for us. So first off, what demand gen wisdom are you sprinkling on the audience today, Brian? Well, we're actually getting started with our annual planning. Um, we're only halfway through our fiscal year. Um, we're on a kind of a strange fiscal year, but we have a, a long, what we call a long range planning process that starts um, at, in November every year. And one of the things that we spend a lot of time on strategically is identifying all of the accounts that we want to go after globally instead of trying to be all things to all people in a massive market and thousands and thousands of companies, we're really focused on identifying the types of solutions we can promote to specific companies, doing a lot of research around that. So identifying business fit, account fit, um, types of, you know, types of industries um, that we're also using intent data to help identify um, potential fit in some companies to basically create a target account list um, and focusing very deeply on that. My point with all of that is <clears throat> even if you're in a smaller company um, where you, you have to get scrappy and have lots of activity and get lots of things in market, the more upfront work you can do to plan and prepare for who you want to engage with and then the stories you want to engage them with to drive that response or capture a response, create some conversations, create some interest. That makes it worthwhile in the long run. It is heavy lifting. It takes a lot of work. Um, you have to crunch a lot of data uh, if you have it. And <clears throat> what we found is that all of that upfront work, it actually pays tremendous dividends in the long run because we are able to focus, focus messages on the right companies, focus the right content, focus on buyer journeys and personas. Um, so I guess, you know, if there's any big sprinkle, um, it's, it's that upfront work in identifying who you should be engaging with, um, who you stand the best chances of potentially winning with, and then the, the buying journey, doing that work and identifying the right personas. Some of that isn't going to be new that any of anybody's heard, but the difference is where, where people succeed or companies and teams succeed is how well they do that, pre that preparation up front, because that helps inform what they can execute against down the line. So it's probably a big, massive sprinkle. I don't know, but it's that that's kind of what the way I would look at it. Just all of that upfront work. Um, I think it, what I found is it's it's been immensely valuable um, for my team in how we execute and launch campaigns and then the results that we're getting as a result. 
massive sprinkle. Maybe we need another section of the show called massive sprinkles. <laughs> You've inspired me, Brian. One quick follow-up question for that. So in that research process, in that finiting of your intent data and your personas and things like that, any specific tools that have been very helpful or media outlets or research partners or things in those realms that have been helpful for your organization as you're kind of refining these processes? Yeah. So, um, Internally within our own stack, um, you know, we, we have uh, a fairly generic stack. So it's Salesforce, Marketo, and demand base. And then um, we also have Bombora for intent. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that, that's kind of like the four-legged stool for us. And then we have a bunch of ancillary tools that we plug in around that. We also use uh, Clary um, for our decision support and analytics um, which helps us kind of distill and pull out and crunch all of the information that we're capturing, mostly in Salesforce. Um, and, um, you know, and just as important with all of that in our stack is also the data model that we have within the systems. So making sure that we're capturing the right information, you have the right data structure, the, all the attributes that we're tracking, and then being able to pull that out. And then slice and dice that appropriately, you know, either two dimensionally or three or four dimensionally, just to come up with some models to identify where we're seeing some good signals um, for us to actually focus our efforts. Awesome. Thank you for sharing all that. And speaking of Clary, if anyone is a fan of Devin Reed of Clary, he's actually going to be part of our AI summit. He's going to be on a section of that about content repurposing. So great for any event marketers and demand generation marketers in the room. So again, if you want to join that session, feel free to hop over to that AI summit button, click it, and we will get you registered on the back end. Uh, so Michelle, now it's your turn. What are your sprinkles of demand for us today? Sure. Well, that's a tough act to follow. Big chunks of demand sprinkles or whatever. Um, I love it. Thank you, Brian. Um, I, I will say like, you know, kind of riffing on where he was going there, that mapping process, we find very, very important as well. Kind of understanding your personas. And I, I truly, maybe this is a hot take, but I truly don't care as much about mapping content to top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom funnel. Personally, I feel like that's kind of a little bit of like an old model. Um, it may be done. It may be useful for you internally to kind of organize your thoughts around your content. But truly, I feel like, you know, what we were talking about earlier, where buyers exist in kind of one of two places, either they're ready to buy or they're not, not ready to buy. And it's, mm -hmm. it's like one to 2%, maybe 3% that are ready. And that content should be there for them at the right place, right time, right format kind of thing, doing their research and found in a trusted way, hopefully in a, in an easy way where it's minimal gating, you know, hopefully you're, you're serving them up in places that are, are easy to access and not lengthy forms and um, behind walls and stuff like that. But that's that's one of the things I think has been super important for me to think through and like use in my mapping exercise, um, if you will, as across my career. So <laughs> sort of getting away from that traditional journey that we think of things or that we've been taught maybe to think of um, and and thinking about the buyer's journey is not linear, you know, and we just have that's to make sure that we have the right content wherever it is that they end up coming from. Um, the other piece I know, you, you know, you're touching on intent and <laughs> that was music to my ears, as many of you may be familiar with ZoomInfo. That's one of the things we rely on heavily. Um, and this is not a sales pitch, but we certainly have, you know, acres of information on how to make intent data actionable. Um, I think we actually came out with a great blog post on that recently, breaking it down into three types of intent. One of my favorites actually is declared intent, like known intent. And that's kind of that first party signal, like, hi, I want to come to this event. You know, I'm signing up, I'm here, I'm listening to you for an hour um, or whatever, you, what have you. Even visits your website. A lot of times we miss the mark there as marketers because we know those people. We often have them in our database. We should be able to see and act on those visits, not not even if they convert on a form, right? And we can do our research and gather in the background all of those signals and organize them how it makes sense for our business into whatever scoring or cues or campaigns, programs that we can acknowledge that activity. So 
that declared intent, the known intent, I think is one of my favorites, but we have a lot of uh, other cool uh, inferred intent um, offered by our platform. So that's something that we have we rely on heavily as well and is super powerful in kind of automating some of those motions. So um, well, I a, love various sprinkles, I guess. <laughs> various. Those are good ones. I love it. Well, I think it's really great when people challenge the status quo. And I think that is something I'm seeing, even with only two episodes of the show out, that we are bringing to the forefront is challenging some of those status quos that we as marketers have just kind of sat in and been comfortable in. And I think you're right with we think it's we try to think it's very black and white and very like A, B, C, but no, it's like a flopping fish. It's like A and then J Mm -hmm. and then Z and then B. And so being prepared to address all those situations is super duper important. And I know we've been talking a lot about intent in this first segment, so it kind of pairs well with our next segment, which is bringing in the dough. So this segment is all about attribution and revenue and reporting. So from strategic goal setting to pro tips on how to best report on your attribution data and how marketing is actually bringing in revenue into your organization, we're about to break those all down in this segment. Um, So Michelle, we're going to start with you. What's on your mind when it comes to attribution? Yes. So I, I teed off by defining demand, right? In in that demand creation, demand capture, demand conversion. And ideally, we set up attribution across those pieces. And I think that, you know, traditionally, attribution has been looking only at creation or at like a single point in time. Maybe it was like last touch, first touch. Um, And if we're lucky, we can get like the full picture. But what what I've noticed in my experience is there's no perfect model attribution is very hard and it can really only, I think, be directional and give you, um, if you're able to look at many dimensions at once, it can give you kind of a good push in the right direction. But I don't recommend necessarily relying on any one certain model to make or break big decisions in your org. (laughs) In fact, a lot of marketing attribution tools or like classic setup is is meant to sort of inflate marketing contribution to pipeline, to revenue, et cetera. And it makes us all look really good. So I should love it, but I don't believe fundamentally that it's actually telling us the truth. So I wanna make sure that if you if you set up a marketing attribution model, it's flexible, it's dimensional. You can go in and make sure you have the correct data flowing into it and be able to pivot around depending on what you're looking at. If you're looking at creation, capture, conversion. So that's my thought there. But I mean, I could talk all day about my thoughts on attribution. So I want to hear what Brian thinks too. Yeah, Brian, over to you. Oh, attribution. I love to hate attribution. Man, it's (laughs) it's, uh, kind of the bane of my system. Right? (laughs) Um, And it's it's tough. So... um, It was interesting looking at the poll data that right in the middle, it looked like around 65% were, you know, struggling with it or room for improvement. Um, And, you know, 27% or a quarter have a well-built system. And I think, you know, attribution tools and systems have been around for almost 10 years now, around 10 years. So I think it shows that we're still struggling with that. One One of the challenges that I've faced over the years is, um, <clears throat> establishing a, a model that ha- that is credible. And I think that's to Michelle's point where you can go in and say that you're either sourcing data or sourcing pipeline in revenue or influencing pipeline in revenue and then trying to explain what that means to all of the stakeholders outside of marketing and explain it in a way um, that is credible and understandable that people will buy into is really, really tough. And um, I think one of the things that's especially challenging with that, no matter how good the tools are that you're using, there's always going to be touch points that you miss. You know, you're not going to be able to capture every single touch point. Um, You know, I'm sure it's just a a fraction of all of the touch points and engagements that prospects and customers have. So, you know, there's an inherent flaw right there. 
Um, one of the things that we did a year ago, um, we have a wonderful marketing operations team here that are just brilliant with, with data. They, they created a model um, with the tools that we use that help us identify the sourcing piece, which I don't like, but we have to use sourcing, and then the influence piece as well. And then we put some criteria around that and some rules that we could explain to our sales leadership and our executive leadership when we would try to explain how we're performing quarter over quarter. I think that's really important to explain the data you're capturing um, how you're capturing it and to kind of put a, a shelf life on that data in some cases. So um, that, you know, there, there, there's a level of credibility there because you're critiquing yourself. And I think the more critical marketing is of themselves, um, especially with a broader team um, that, that just establishes some credibility Um <clears throat> And then when you have those rules in place and you explain how you're going to report on that, um, again, that establishes that credibility. And then ultimately what happens is, at least what's happened with me, which I like, is I have a specific pipeline goal. Um, so I, my very existence at LiveRamp is based heavily on how much pipeline um, I am generating and influencing through our marketing effort here. And it's a, it's a big number and it's a big scary number, but the good news is we have data in place and we have tools in place that the organization views as credible. And I view it as credible as well. And we can look at all of the different ways that we're in sourcing and influencing pipeline and then ultimately deals. And then the, the next piece is the velocity behind those deals as well, which, um, uh, it is very useful for the organization, and um, but it's it's difficult. It's heavy lifting, but I think it has to be done um, just simply because there's so much scrutiny on marketing and the dollars that are being spent and the performance. You can't be an arts and crafts or activity-based marketer anymore. You have to be able to show that you have some performance um, and some contribution to the bottom line. Yes, especially in uh, this economy and kind of what we're all facing, especially in B2B tech right now. Um, I think that really paints the picture there. And I think kind of synopsizing what you said, it sounds like sales marketing all needs to be on the same page first and foremost. Then you need kind of a working cheat sheet of like, here are all the things that are important to us, how they're defined, how we're tracking, how we're kind of pulling them into our dashboards and whatnot. And then being able to be credible with that and be trusted with that and be open with all that information. And I think one pitfall I have seen of many marketing orgs and sale orgs is that they finagle their attribution too often and too much. So they're not able to have an apples to apples comparison over time. So I guess if I'll add my own tip here, it's just to be able to sit in your data, give it enough time to reflect appropriately and accurately, because so often I see marketers like more than once a quarter changing things and tweaking things and making adjustments. And that's going to kind of muddy the waters, I think, in the long term. So be comfortable with your data, be confident with your data. It's hard and takes a lot of work, like you said, Brian. Um, but just be sure you're not finagling it too much too often. Um, but this is going to bring us into our next section. So this is donut holes. So donut holes is all about what we are glazing over in marketing. So what are we not doing? What are common gaps, mistakes, and like what's missing in marketing? So Brian, where do you see some of the biggest gaps and misses when it comes to demand generation or marketing teams? Uh, so there's, there's a couple that come to mind, um, and I'll try and keep it brief, but I think... <clears throat> Regardless of where an SDR or a BDR team sits, if it sits in marketing or if it sits in sales, um, that that is a resource that I think all companies struggle with. And <clears throat> depending on how you can structure that and integrate a demand generation team with an SDR or BDR team, that can give you a turbo boost on, on your campaign efforts. 
Um, <clears throat> and I think that that can be a big donut hole um, in, in some cases, depending on the level of an en enablement you have, um, the level of communication between the teams, the consistency in how SDRs and BDRs work with their leads and, and accounts. Um, you know, I think th there's a huge opportunity there, but it's also something that I think many, many companies struggle with. Um, so that, 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 that's probably one of the biggest ones. And then the other area that uh, no matter where I've been, regardless of what company it is, what size, Content is always, always, always a, a challenge. There's never enough content. And, um, you know, I view content as the fuel to that drives any kind of campaign effort, whether or not it's a one-to-one -one ABM campaign or a broader, um, a broader campaign or events. Creating useful, meaningful, entertaining, educational content is really difficult. And um, even with AI, you know, it's, it's still hard to create content that's going to be useful. Um, and if there's a focused effort to create content that's uh, meaningful and doing it in a quick way and producing that and publishing it, and then just measuring what the response is, um, I, companies that do that really well, they're the ones that are going to crank and do just have amazing production and, and pipeline and opportunities. Well, the content marketer over here really appreciates you saying that, Brian. <laughs> but it I is love content. I love content. <laughs> well, and it's just a matter of fact of, you know, scaling and, and that idea of the more you can get out the door, the better off you'll be. Granted, it needs to be quality, right? You did bring up That's the right. AI conundrum where, you know, if you're putting out, quite frankly, like shitty content, it's probably not going to have the best ROI long term. Um, so appreciate you brought up the, the dichotomy there, too. And so, Michelle, what donut holes are you seeing in marketing teams and demand generation teams? Yes. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of riff off of what Brian started with there as far as the uh, your SDR team. And my take on that or my angle there for our donut hole is uh, addressing that marketing to sales handoff. So, again, regardless of where they sit, mar under marketing, under sales, where ha wherever, um, one of the things that I've found to be most impactful, whether you're brand new to your org or you're very tenured, tear it down, not necessarily take it down, but go through and audit it and see where the holes are, see where there are opportunities to make it better, make it tighter, make it faster, more informative, enable that team because they are kind of that second, the, the pass off, right? And you can have the greatest funnel, the the most amount of leads coming in and they're so, so qualified, but if it kind of falls off and your sales team is confused or the timing is off or that handoff comes on a Friday and they're off on Monday, it's like, you know, or they're at sales kickoff, right. You know, right after you have a big event, like there's a lot of miscommunication there, right? Like tear that down, take an audit, take stock of what's going on there and, and over communicate. <laughs> if you have, uh, weekly digest emails about your events um, and your emails and your whatever campaigns you have running, um, Slack messages in your in their channels, you know, blow them up. I feel like I've never heard a sales team say, oh, the, you're communicating at me too many times. <laughs> I'm over-informed. Um, in fact, I think they're always coming and asking questions. So that tells me we need to do more, you know, and we need to give them better info. So um, that's one of the ways I've I've found to make a great impact and and boost some of those conversions too, those conversion rates through the, through your funnel. So, um, you know, a lot of times, yeah, of course we're looking at volume, but I'm looking at health as it relates to those conversion rates. So that's a super helpful one. Hopefully, some people can take that right back to their desk and do that, um, or or get some buy-in and do that. Um, another one is sort of related to content, actually. So. I'll, I'll kind of riff off of that. I, I agree. It's like, like content is king and it seems like we can never have enough, especially of the stuff that works. Right. So a lot of times we have a ton of content, but not all of it's hitting the mark. You know, we see fatigue. It's, it's already, you know, like, I don't know, outdated. Right. Um, 
trends are coming and going very quickly. So one of the things that I've found very useful, and I've, I've taken this through my career for many years now, is called turkey slicing, and it's sort of seasonal, <laughs> seasonally appropriate. But say you have a great piece of content and you're like, oh, I wish we had more of that, right? Well, why don't you take it and turkey slice it out like Thanksgiving dinner and leftovers or whatever, like you get the idea, and spin it into a little video or a webinar or uh, an infographic, you know, and see if you can get more legs out of that, maybe that big rock piece of content that is already doing really well for you. Um, liven it up a little bit, refresh it. Maybe you don't need a whole new piece of content, right? But your content team could pro would probably love that, <laughs> um, where they don't have to recreate the wheel or start something from scratch, but rather they can go rework something that they already know is going to do well. Um, so that's something that I think a lot of teams overlook um, sometimes is repurposing. And we love a good repurpose, right? <laughs> and that's um, music to my ears, for sure, Michelle. And uh, I'm vegetarian, so I'll say I'm going to uh, cut the so tofurkey. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I love that you bring that up because that's definitely been in the last few years a huge trend across both content marketers and demand generations, generation marketers and marketers in general of how do we get the most, especially when you look at the economy and what we're faced with in the market, like how are you getting the most juice out of your squeeze? How are you getting the most out of the most ROI out of your content? And again, not to plug our own things, but I want to say like, if that is a topic that's interested to those watching, um, we are going to cover that in depth in that session three of the AI summit with Devin Reed, because really, Really, that is so crucial to being able to scale, right? Like you can't always make net new. It's like the reality we all have to face. Can't always like be pushing out brand new, snazzy, you know, totally original. And I'm not going to say these are copycat items, but you also have to consider two people learn differently, right? Like someone might like a live event, but someone might like a blog post or an infographic or so being able to think through that, um, that kind of spectrum of content types and styles just from that one kind of raw content is huge. And then wrapping it back to kind of the beginning of your your comments, like let's all show SDR and BDR teams so love right now. Like, I mean, they work so hard and they do some of the hardest jobs of marketing. Um, I think they desire, they require so much appreciation from us. And it's true. Like I have had my sales team at Goldcast approach me and say, hey, could sharing your stuff on our channels, like we want to know it's live. We want to know what's out there. We want to know what you've been working on and be able to share it out. So I think a lot of marketers and myself included get worried about, oh, I'm going to like, they're going to get annoyed at me or they're going to be like, oh my God, why are you posting yet another thing? But it's actually like so helpful. So I love that you bring that up. And so we're about to jump into our final segment before we get into Q&A. So if you have a Q&A for either Brian or Michelle, feel free to go over, jump in the Q&A. Or if you want to upvote something that you really want to be asked, please do that right now in that Q&A tab on the right. Um, so we are going to go into our final sec segment before we go into questions. And so that is Donut. <laughs> That might be my favorite one. I like the little boings and the little the little bouncing donuts. Um, so Donut Dedications is all about giving a special shout out to a B2B marketer or a B2B brand that you find inspiring and has inspired your own work. Um, whether they're putting out great campaigns, they're doing really smart targeting or attribution or whatever it might be. This is your moment for five seconds just to shine the spotlight on another marketer that you appreciate or a brand you appreciate. Um, so we're gonna jump in and Brian, if you want to go first with your donut dedications. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I, I'll say that I like Zoom Info's marketing, <clears throat> to be honest. Um, so I, I think they have some really good marketing. Um, and I, I like the approach that Sixth Sense has taken in, in their marketing as well. So I, I, I think teams at both organizations do really, really good work there. So th those, those are some shout outs there. And Brian, anything specifically that catches your eye or has like resonated with you as a marketer? I think, well, but for both organizations, you know, they're, they're focused on me as a persona. And so I find a lot of useful information um, from both companies and, you know, especially on the intent data side, when, when there's intent data, um, 
because that's a new way for us to go to market and to engage with people and not just rely on form fills. Um, <clears throat> I think there's some interesting ideas there that come out from, from both, both organizations. Um, and then, you know, just anything that helps, helps us look at different ways to do things that get us away from, you know, filling out freaking forms and PDFs. You know, so uh, I think we're all addicted to PDFs and forms. And, and if we can um, find ways to kind of get away from that, because that's how the buyer is evolving um, and learning techniques and ideas and how to use data and some of those approaches. I think that's really interesting. Yes, definitely agree. And it's all about, you know, if anyone joined us for episode one, LaShonda talked about speaking directly to your audience and really talking to your personas and being able to cater your messaging. So I think that's spot on right there, Brian. So Michelle, who are you giving a shout out to? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to go a little, a little crazy here. I know this is donuts in demand, but I'm going to shout out a brand marketer that I really, really respect. Um, Peter Weinberg and John Lombardo actually from both from LinkedIn as part of the B2B, uh, Institute. So they're doing a lot of interesting research around why brand matters for B2B and don't get me wrong. Like we're all focused on demand gen creation, you know, capture conversion. Right. But happens with a really solid brand foundation, in my opinion, and based on the research that they're com coming out with. So we actually infused a lot of that into our own brand campaign that's out in the wild right now at Zoom Info. So I'm really, I, I'm actually relatively new to Zoom Info still. And I was really excited to see that happening as I came here as a demand gen marketer. I was like, that's actually going to make my life easier, right? <laughs> like we're seeding those audiences out there in the world with this kind of like brand level thought leadership um, activity at this time. And over time, you know, that will help lift my, my boats, right? Like rising tide lifts all boats or something like that. <laughs> um, so I I'm really excited about that. It's helped us um, as a company already, but I think that research, it could be really interesting for the audience here to go find. Um, they're very active on LinkedIn, obviously, but have put together quite, quite an interesting portfolio of research over the years. Love it. That's super helpful. And I can't wait to go and creep on all the stuff they're putting out there because I um, consider myself a brand marketer. I think that's always been the space that I've sat in, especially as a content leader. And so it's nice to see because sometimes things can get frayed between like the demand gen side and the brand side. Like there are some like push and pull and arguments well, sometimes. Yeah, when it comes to budget for sure, right? <laughs> a little, little yeah. I see it's slicey, um, but yeah. I love that you are able to see the connection and the importance of like building your brand while you are also then capturing that demand that you're building off that brand. So like, I appreciate that. So now we're going to jump into the Q&A section. Um, so please take a few moments to jump in that Q&A tab and upvote which questions you want us to ask. Um, we have about 15 minutes-ish left to do questions and answers. So go over there, upvote what you want us to um, talk about next. We did get two questions before we even started the episode. So as a reminder for future episodes, you can always email me at lindsay at goldcast.io with questions you want to ask our guests. So first off, it is going to be um, from Nicole McKayler, I think is McKayle, McKayler. Sorry if I just butchered your last name. Uh, it's part of my job here, I guess. Um, Lifestyle Marketing Manager at Attentive. She asked, how can I identify the right accounts for ABM marketing? So Brian, Michelle, who wants to tackle this one first? Uh, I'll start, I guess. So what, this is a process that we're going through. Um, so we're we, we take a number of attributes into account. Um, <clears throat> we look at everything from whether or not companies, uh, we had opportunities with companies in the past um, that we either won or lost um, and whether or not we can go back and try and re-engage with them. Um, a lot of times, and I've seen this at multiple companies, even if you lose an opportunity one time, the odds of winning the second time, if you can convert or create an opportunity, actually increase. I'm sure there's some research on that, but it's it's really interesting. I think the first time an opportunity is created, um, 
you know, maybe there's a learning process there. The confidence isn't as high, but then the second time around, the confidence is higher. And I think there's a higher chance of winning. So I think looking at previous history, um, I mentioned intent data before. So we're pulling in a lot of intent data that is actually giving us a lot of insights um, that we had no idea about um, on, on some of these accounts um, prior to the, the data that we were capturing. And that just gives us a whole new perspective. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I think um, you, you can't, I, I can't emphasize this enough. If you have a large enough sales team, there is so much anecdotal information that isn't captured in a structured manner in Salesforce. And so you really need to invest a lot of time in talking to some of your top performing sales reps or all of your sales reps just to see what kind of history they have and what their business plans are and then figure out where their priorities are and try and align to that. Um, so I, I think that's very important to kind of look at account selection holistically, a data perspective, sales perspective, you know, maybe some anecdotal um, soft data in there as well. Um, and then figure out what kind of product fit um, or solution fit or story that you want to go after or in, and target those accounts with. Michelle, anything to add on to that? Um, I I was kind of thinking through that, actually taking a couple of notes, but I, I would echo most of that 100 percent. So we've we've gone through that kind of ICP exercise right on the marketing side. We often will go directly to sales and work closely with them to do that account um, prioritization exercise and for, and also do an analysis on where we have a propensity to win, whether that's based off of um, company revenue, industry, company size, employee size, right? Um, and then model off of that. And there's your, there's your target account list. So it's not like this magic wand. It takes, I think it's a lot of inputs and a lot of various angles to come at it from to make it to make it most thorough or comprehensive. But um, yeah, I would agree that it, it's very similar to Brian. Those are some exercises we've gone through. And then I think you touched on Brian going in and looking at your closed lost ops. <laughs> and I've stocked Salesforce data and opportunity notes and opportunity lost reasons, right? And I've I've come back to sales and I've said, hey, can we run a campaign against these people? <laughs> you know, can we run some messaging against them? And let's see if we can get them back. Because to your point, it's 100% not for sure that it's closed lost, right? At least not, you know, for the long term, maybe for now. So, um, you know, that can be another kind of ABM strategy too. And, and there's no like one one ABM list. I think we've yep. been at companies where we have many of them, you know, so um, yeah. I think it varies by company, but come at it from a lot of different angles. I think that one is brilliant. The last one you brought up there, Michelle, because especially if you're at a tech company that is pushing out tier two or tier three releases very frequently, mm -hmm. you can easily go in, identify which ops were lost because you did not have functionality X, Y, Z, and then easily spin up a campaign in, you know, two, three days a week, maybe depending how large and retarget those people once you have that capability or that product in your suite. So that is a really brilliant thing to bring up because I think sometimes we just forget about that, right? Like we get so obsessed with like the ABM part of it and the actual accounts that we forget what we might be able to offer them as part of that ABM. So love that tip. So next we are going to talk about um, localization and um, actually, no, not localization. Uh, she's from Localize. So Brittany Brown, head of revenue marketing at Localize asked, how are you all managing global messaging, transcreation and localization, um, especially because both of you do handle global marketing at your organizations and you're talking to a vast amount of ICPs and audiences and locations. So let's talk about how you manage global messaging as a whole. Um, yeah, I can jump in and I, I'll talk a little bit about how I've done it in the past and I'm just, we're just kind of getting into that here. Um, as, as again, I'm, I've, I'm almost three months in to my time at Zoom Info, so still, um, digesting and then also kind of auditing how we're doing it. But, um, a model that I've seen work really well in the past is we, especially when it comes to doing more with less these days and trying to scale wherever possible is taking taking a campaigns approach, like a global campaigns approach and essentially aligning on 
um, who you want to be and what you want to say uh, for for that period of time. Maybe that's a quarter, or a year, or a half, what have you. And from there, you're you're offering and working closely with the regional teams to understand. All right, will this resonate in your region? Will you be able to kind of ladder into this campaign or this theme, um, into this messaging? And here are the here are the programs that we are proposing from. Um, you know, either an HQ or North America standpoint or where, wherever you are and how, you know, how can we spin those? How can we localize them? How can we make them appropriate for the various regions um, that, that, that you may be trying to address? Um, those local marketers will then say often, at least in my experience, yes, okay, we're going to be able to take this, this, and this. We're going to spin this a little bit differently. We're going to bring in a local speaker. Um, we're going to take this piece of content and add in a local, a localized piece of research or quote or local customer, right, to kind of ensure that it's it's going to resonate in that market or in that local um, region. So that's that's generally how I've approached it in the past. We kind of set this framework um, at one point and we're hoping to kind of set it up so that it can be scaled off of for the regions. And they're coming in most likely with a more limited calendar, maybe a different database, different needs, different schedule. And they're kind of taking the pieces that they need, spinning it out as they as they can uh, to be resonant with that local audience. Brian, anything to add on to that? Yeah, localization is tough uh, for us because <clears throat> depending on what part of the world we're trying to market in, there's gonna be different levels of maturity that will understand concepts and technologies different at different levels. So if we, if we go out to market in Japan with a certain message, it may not resonate at all. So just doing a straight localization translation isn't always the right approach. We want to make sure that we're representing the brand and our story and the solutions um, appropriately, but we also have to make sure that there is that localization positioning that will resonate best resonate with that market. Um, we use a, a mix of um, freelancers, agencies, and then we also work with um, the local teams just to vet and make sure that the positioning is done correctly and. Uh, that, that messaging makes sense. And then we'll publish that through through different channels that way. Go directly to the source. It's almost always the best way to do it, right? Yeah. So, all right, I think we have time for one more question before we wrap up today's episode. So this one is coming from Jacob Doro. So he's asking, provide your biggest hot take today and what marketers should unlearn that was once viewed as a good model and now might not be. And if you like hot takes, if you go over to that docs tab on the right, there's actually a follow-up blog post from our first episode of Donuts in Demand that talks all about Chris Walker and LaShonda Jackson's hot takes. So this is your jam. Check that article out. So Brian, Michelle, who wants to jump in with something we need to unlearn as marketers? Oh, this is fun. Um... I'll, I'll jump in real quick. I, I think I've even I've, I've mentioned campaigns or the, the word campaigns in this conversation, but I think that's the one. Like for me, um, I actually want to try to change the narrative there and and not think so much about campaigns. In fact, I'm trying to think a little bit more about doing things just programmatically. So a lot of times that word is associated with advertising, right? But programmatic meaning always on, kind of this like humming engine and that's that's often what i want to be known as like as a demand gen leader within an org i want to be known as like oh yes like go to her for an engine that's like always on and churning and we can rely on that so campaigns i often think of as like <laughs> moments in time big umbrella you know that kind of has a lot of programs beneath it um sort of one off inside of that campaign but on my preference, and maybe because I come from a bit of an ops back, marketing ops background, is this programmatic approach. I've seen it be really effective because you kind of are like a locomotive. <laughs> you start out with a little bit, maybe a webinar series like Donuts in Demand, and it grows over time. It becomes part of your brand. It becomes a little bit more known, and people start to remember, ah, Donuts in Demand, Goldcast, right? And you start to like have that, that stickiness. Um, you could do that with a webinar series, with your emails, um, newsletters. You could do that with a podcast series. 
other programmatized approaches across your marketing channels is just, I think, like the right way to be thinking about stuff personally um, and getting away from those like <laughs> moment in time campaigns that can kind of come and go. Um, that may be appropriate in some degree, but like having that kind of baseline, I think is so, so important um, and, and helpful as far as like building momentum. Michelle, do you, do, and what about, you know, just considering tactics as a campaign too? So like email marketing is a campaign or, you know, paid search is a campaign. I think if you can weave all of those together, yeah. um, that, that's where it gets effective and not just limit yourself to a single, a single tactic. Yes, 100%. Um, yeah. Well, it's interesting that we brought up the campaign versus programming thing for a second time on this show, because actually Chris Walker talked about that too on our last no, episode. No, I know. And so it's so funny. It's like, keep <laughs> coming. Uh, no, I think it's important because I think it's a shift in marketers. I think it's a shift in strategy and thinking. And also, if this is something you're thinking about and you're fascinated by this idea of how can we do more programmatic programming. Da, da, da. Um, we're actually going to run a series masterclass in November and December. So keep your eyes peeled, everyone, for that. It's coming down uh, the pipeline. And if that is something that intrigues you as part of your go-to-market strategy for 2024, we hope to see you there. Um, so we are actually at the end of our time. It flew by. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. I hope you had a blast. I sure like learned so much from Brian and Michelle. So thank you again for spending this hour with us, uh, showing off your donuts, having sprinkling of a demand gen success throughout. We really appreciate it. And just a few closing notes from me before I let you all go. Again, if you want to join our AI Summit coming up next week, um, click that button right at the top. 12 amazing speakers across five different sessions, all about how marketers can actually use AI versus like, you know, oh, it can potentially do this and do that. No, we're going to actually talk about how you can use it in your real day to day life. And then if you want to join us next month, which I hope you do, our next episode is on November 14th. We are hosting Susanna Blau, who is actually here watching today. You might have seen her in the chat. Um, she is the uh, head of digital demand and campaign management for Nokia Cloud and Network Services. And we'll also have Sarah McConnell, VP of Demand Generation at Qualified. So we're all going to be talking about marketing attribution, generating more inbound pipeline, and building a loved and trusted brand, which I think will be like a great follow-up because we talked a lot about that today, Brian, Michelle, of just how to build that trust both internally with your uh, employees and then externally with your audience, your market, your customers. So thank you both for joining us today. And I hope to see everyone on our next episode on November 14th. Thank you. Bye, all. Bye. Have a great day.